My name is Edna Zupo. I was born in Tawny Town, November the 2nd, 1937. You have my permission to interview about my restaurant, Mama Z's. Thank you. Now, uh, the first question we want to know is who were your parents? Tell me about your mom and dad. Mom and dad were Enea and Vivian Morsani. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Haney. And Daddy's name, of course, is Morsani. So he was one of the descendants of the original settlers that came into Tiny Town. Thank you. And tell me about your grandparents first on your father's side. On my father's side, they were uh, part of the original uh, settlers that came here. And uh, they were from Orvino, Italy. And... Uh, like I said, they were one of the first ones, so I'll be guessing, but I think they got here in 1898, I believe. But that's that's just my remembrance of it. Okay, great. Now tell me, what about your mom's parents? Who were they, and, and what do you do My mo them? mom's parents was Louis Haney and Laura Haney, and he moved his family down here from... Uh, Nebraska. They lived in Mead, Nebraska, and I don't know the reason, but he packed up his family and moved to here. Thank you. Tell me about your family at home. Who are your siblings, your brothers and sisters? Well, I only have one sister, and her name is Adrienne Graham now. Uh, she married a fellow from Houston, Texas, and... Uh, so they had, they stayed there and they were in the banking business. But there's just the two of us and we're four years apart. Uh, tell me, when you were growing up as a child, uh, what was the business was your family and your parents? What did they do for a living? They were farmers. They raised chickens. My parents raised chickens and grapes and milk cows. So they were just typically um, farmers. Um, what was your part in the family business? How would you help them? What were chores and stuff did you have to do? Well, I'd have to help mother in the house. And then I did help milk. Uh, my sister and I both learned to milk. And every once in a while, we had to feed the chickens, too. And then I learned to drive on a tractor, so I helped in the grapes. And when I was big enough, my well, daddy taught me to drive, and it was on the big old Oliver tractor. And so that's when I started helping at home. What else do you remember about helping around on the farm? Not a whole lot. Like I said, we were very small. It was just a small uh, farm, so... Uh, that was mainly all I did. I got to, we had to feed chickens occasionally for daddy. And then once in a while, we'd have to all go milk. So we had, uh, I don't remember, six or eight cows. And so we all pitched in and helped milk. We'd milk one, on, one of us on each side of the cow <laughs> and hope that they didn't step on us. <laughs> um. Besides working around the family farm and at the home to help your family, what other jobs did you have when you were young um, to make money or to help out? I didn't go to work until I was uh, out of high school, which was 1955. I, I didn't have to go to work. Uh, we just took care of ourselves with the farm. We raised our own garden. And I'd help Mother can and you know, and that sort of thing. We made, mother made homemade bread every week and mother made homemade cheese and they make homemade salami and we just helped with it, whatever they were doing at the time. Um, tell me about your earliest memories of Tawny Town. When do you first remember going into Tawny Town and what do you remember about it? Well, I don't remember a lot, just going to school. That was 
uh, we lived about a mile and a quarter from school. And my dad would usually take me. I didn't have to walk 10 miles in the snow, like some say. <laughs> but I just, uh, daddy would take me to school. And uh, that's all I remember. I'd get up and get ready, go to school. Well, tell me, uh, what was it like going to school? What was a typical day at school like for you? Well, we had the sisters. The Sisters of Mercy came and opened the school whenever, I don't remember what year, but it was long before I got to school. And so we always had the sisters, and uh, each classroom had three grades, first, second, and third, and so forth. They had three gate grades in each classroom. And your basic day was reading and math. And uh, we, I guess the information that we were taught, uh, we often wondered how I was working to put three grades in one school, in one classroom. But it, you learn from each, each teaching, whether they was teaching the first grade or whether they was teaching the third grade, you learn from all of it, is the way I had it. And uh, then we'd have recess in mid-morning and we'd have lunch hour. And during lunch hour, we used to uh, choose teams and we played, I can remember playing baseball at school. And uh, we played relay and Oh, what else was it? Kick the can, those sort of games. And swing, we had big swing set. So we'd get to swing and uh, that was about the day. We didn't have a whole lot of activity. Uh, what local stores do you remember shopping in? Did you and your family go in and trade in town? Uh, in Tawny Town, my uncle and aunt had a store and that's the same store I was born in. Mother for whatever reason stopped there and they lived in an upstairs apartment uh, over the store. And so mother stopped there and that's where I was born, upstairs over that store. And we always stopped at Uncle Claude's store. We never went to the other one for anything. So uh, Uncle Claude and Aunt Emma uh, Morsani, uh, had a little store and and he had every, anything you'd want. He kept uh, cheeses and salami and uh, lunch meats and all the needy, all the little things you'd need other than what you raised. And uh, my grandmother used to spoil him. She'd raise a garden and then she'd go get part of it and she'd cook it and send it up to the store to her other boy. <laughs> so she'd send one son up there to, to bring cooked vegetables that Nona cooked up to her son Claude. And he loved that because it was just special. Nobody cooked like Nona. <laughs> so, but that's what I remember. You talked, a lot of people have talked about Claude and, and uh, his wife, but tell me, what were they like as people? You know, I know they ran the store, but tell, tell about their personality. Oh, they didn't know a stranger. He made friends with everybody that walked in the store and people got to know him. And uh, he just uh, was just a people person, both of them were. So they, they loved everybody to come in and uh, did business with everybody that come in. Uh, even though if you may not have shopped at the other stores, what other stores do you remember there being and who ran them? Well, they were ran by Richard and B. Artimani, and it was up on the corner by the church, or it was across the street first, and then they built that big store up on the corner but uh, Uncle B, he was, uh, he was married to my mother's twin sister. So Uncle B and Richard Artimani, which he was no relation to me, but Uncle B was. And then Uncle B had kids that got to be big enough that they could help in the store. 
Uncle B's son worked in the store, and uh, then he'd get bigger boys, the bigger boys, they'd tie it down and they'd help them. But, uh, and then it was a feed store too. They even had a feed store up there. And uh, across from the big store that's there now, there was a grocery store, a feed store, and the post office. And then after Uncle B and Richard built the big store, well, then they moved back over there. And later, uh, there was a cafe in that corner. Jake Jarrell had a cafe. We used to hang out there a lot. So. What was the name of the cafe and, and what kind of menu did they have? It was just Jake's Cafe, if I remember right. And uh, I don't remember having a menu. We just go in there to have a Coke and hang around with the kids, you know. But it wasn't a menu that we looked for. Uh, tell me, uh, what were, in those days when you were young, what were the restaurants in town where you could go to buy stuff? Well, the Venetian Inn's been in there for a lot of years, but I never went in it. We ate at home. We didn't go out to eat. And uh, Mary Maestries was in town. Now, she started in her house, and then later she built a big uh, restaurant up on the highway. And uh, there was a big house there, and uh, this other family had built it and moved into it, and then later she bought it and put a restaurant in there. Uh, tell me about uh, your time working at the restaurants, the two you just mentioned. Uh, uh, when did I, you start uh, roughly, and about what, what did you do there? Well, I first, I was working at the school lunchroom, and uh, then I, we needed a little extra money, so I would come home and get supper on the table for my kids, and then I'd go to work at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon and work till nine or 10 o'clock that night and come home and uh, go to bed. And then I was back up at six o'clock in the morning to go to school and, and work at the lunchroom at school. So it was hard work, but we needed the money, so. Well, tell me again, which was the first place you worked? The first place I worked was Venetian Inn. Uh, no, I take that back. The first place I worked was Mary Maestri's. I had heard that she was looking for a cook, or, and so I went to work there, and uh, my job was to help with whatever, whatever in the kitchen. Uh, we washed dishes and we fixed dishes, you know, like he had spaghetti. And so we kept that all going and, and then we served the dishes out to the waitresses. And then, uh, then I lost that job after a few months. And uh, so uh, I had heard that the Venetian Inn was looking for help. So I just turned around and went up there and asked for a job and got it right away. So, and my job there was, I helped make the spaghetti and I helped uh, cut out the rolls and fix them, you know, in the pans ready to bake. And uh, I helped with the dishes there too. The, the ladies, we were all in one little room there. And so when they'd get a little bit behind, well, I'd reach over and help them with the dishes. And, uh, then uh, I, I didn't, I just cut out the bread. I didn't make it. Another lady made it. And uh, I would cut it out and put it in the pans for her. When you worked at Venetian Inn, who, tell me about who was the managers and their owners and what were they like to work for? Okay, the owners were Alice and Paul Leatherman and they were wonderful people to work for. They. Alice was one of these that liked to pull a joke on people, and she was a cut up, and she, and uh, she was very easy to work for. She never, it wasn't like a bossy boss. It, she just was a pleasant woman. She, and everybody else, everybody that worked there, 
knew exactly how to cook whatever they were supposed to be cooking. It was the older Italian ladies from Tawnytown was her help. And they all knew how to cook whatever, you know, if it's frying steaks or making salad and making the sauce, whatever. They all knew how. They just went to work and did what they supposed to do. Alice didn't have to worry about whether it ever went out right or not because it did. Uh, tell me about the Venetian cabins or the, the people that, the inns they had there for, you know, who would come stay and uh, how often would they have visitors? Well, I don't remember ever seeing visitors there. Uh, by the time I went to work there, they were just vacant and uh, they didn't, they, they never used them as cabins one after, by the time I went to work there. They were just vacant. And then I, I guess they used it for some storage or something, but I, like I said, I never saw anybody stay there as a guest. They changed one of them. They made one cabin into the bathroom for the men, so they always had to go, because they didn't have enough facility in the restaurant, so the men had to go outside to the cabin for a restroom. So how did you go from working at Mary Maestri's and Venetian Inn to eventually opening up your own restaurant? Well, between there, I went to work for Willis Shaw Trucking Firm in Elm Springs. And I worked there for 12 and a half years. And uh, I did, uh, I was, did the settlements for the truck drivers. We did the paperwork and then it went on to a payroll person and she made out the checks. But uh, that was my job then. And then later I became the supervisor of that department. And so I still did the same thing, but I was in charge of three other girls besides myself. And uh, then I just got tired of that job. I was making good money, but it just, you know how you get tired of jobs and I was tired of it. My husband wanted to know why I was trying to go to work, get a restaurant whenever I knew what I was making and it had steady work. And I said, well, I'm just tired of it. I want to do something else. And uh, I called at that time, uh, Paul Maestri owned the hometown drive-in, which is where Mama sees is now. And uh, so I'd call Paul or his wife, Judy, and I'd tell them I was interested, interested in that building. And if they ever decided to sell, I wanted first chance at it. Well, as luck would have it, they went on the market the next week. And... Uh, so I called them and I talked to them and Paul and I negotiated on a price and and I bought it. No, I didn't buy it at first. I rented it. And uh, the first year I rented it because I didn't know exactly, I didn't think we were going to have that much business. Well, the first day we opened, they stood in line on us and scared me to death. Well, I went to work at 5.30 that morning and I worked till 11 o'clock that night because I, it took me that long to, to finish up and clean up and put things away. And I had to get there early to make breakfast. And so I was exhausted by the time that day was over. So I got tormented a lot, but I put a sign on the door, closed until I get more help. <laughs> so I was given bad reputation about doing that, closing it as soon as I opened it. <laughs> but it was temporary. I have got some help and went back to work. And uh, my daughter Lisa and I went to we did it together. And uh, we were the first the owners. And uh, so we just dug in and did, and she worked at nights and I worked in the daytime. And, but sometimes we'd have to help each other out. And I had other kids working it. I had a son working at Pam Trucking. And I had a daughter working at Willis Shaw. And Tommy was working at Pam Trucking. Anyway, they'd all come up for lunch. 
and then they'd pitch in and help us wash dishes so we'd get caught up. <laughs> so it was interesting, to say the least. Um, how well did the business do compared to what you expected? Well, our business flourished right off the bat, and the kids were scared and said, you know, we're not going to be able to do this and this, and, you know, naming off things we needed to get done in the daytime. And I said, what are you all afraid of? I think we're going to be sitting around doing nothing a lot, so we have plenty of time to prep and do things. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> we We had to... We learned how to do things as we went along, and it was just uh, very, it surprised me. I had people at Pam that knew me as a person, as you know, and as a cook. Uh, had people at Willis Shaw that was waiting for me to open the doors, and uh, they, they alike knew me from down there, and we'd have dinners together, you know. And I always cook what I knew how to cook. And one fella was my boss at the time. He said, well, I used to get this free. And I said, sorry, that ain't happening no more. <laughs> so, but it was very, uh, and then uh, Sally and Leon Zupo had the station next door. Well, she was my first customer. She walked in at 1030 waiting for lunch and it, lunch wasn't quite ready yet. But she was my first customer to come in, and she said, I didn't want to miss lunch. <laughs> so that's kind of the way it all started. Um, you seem to get a smile on your face when you recall these memories. I mean, tell me about more of the customers, maybe some that you didn't know when they came in, some that you got to know just at the restaurant. Who are some of the ones you remember? Well, I probably can't tell you their names yet. I, you know, the, I knew them when they come in, and I, I'd walk around and visit with some of them if I did know them. Uh, we had, uh, well, I can't think of his name now. Uh, the co the owner of the Cowboys, what was his name? Uh, yeah. Jerry Jones. Well, one night they came in and his sons, and he wanted just to buy beer. And I said, no, you can't buy alcoholic drinks if you don't eat and so then he ordered some food some appetizers or something they sat there and ate that and then they ordered their beer and come to find out he was waiting on a table at Mary Maestri's and he got a phone call and away he went <laughs> so that's kind of interesting isn't it <laughs> somebody come in and use your table as a waiting spot to get to another restaurant but well. Speaking of that, you were in business, I guess, at the same time as the Venetian Inn and the yes. Maestri's. Was that a fierce rivalry? Was it a friendly rivalry? It Tell was friendly. That. We didn't. Alice come in and eat lunch with me, and Alice Leatherman that had the Venetian Inn, she'd come in and have lunch with me and tell me how lucky I was to have all these kids because they could help me. She didn't have any children, so she had to depend on help to, that she hired and of course a lot of the kids were from Tawny Town and so uh, she knew them and uh, they all go in there from high school I guess as soon as they hit high school uh, my kids did they'd go up there and get a job whatever making coffee or whatever Alice needed cleaning off the tables and whatever Tell me the story behind the name. Why, why, why did you pick Mama Z's? Is that what people call you? I mean, uh, tell me about that. Okay, when I was working at uh, Willis Shaw's, this uh, fellow started calling me Mama. I was just Mama. And uh, then after time went by, this other fellow from dispatch had come by my desk and He'd say, well, what if it isn't Mama Z? And so then I had read things about when you're opening a business, put a catchy name on it so people don't forget it. They'll always remember it. 
So I kept thinking about it. We kept thrashed around a few names. And one day I said to my daughter, why not Mama Z? And she said, well, that sounds like it'd work. And so we threw that around a little bit and we decided that was it. We was going to stay with that. So that's how I named it, and he didn't know it for a lot of years. I said, do you realize you named this place for me? And he said, no, I didn't. And I said, well, you used to call me Mama Z at work. And he said, yeah, I did. So that's how it come about. Any other Mama Z stories before we all move on? I can't think of any. Uh, I don't know. If, I guess if you'd lead me into one, I could probably tell a story, but I don't, it's not coming to me now. Um, when you were young living in Tawny Town, what, who are some of the people you remember besides just family? I mean, who are some of the people you remember looking up to or maybe prominent in the community that you knew? Well, uh, like I said, we always had the sisters and we uh, always had a parish priest and you knew who they were because they'd come and teach us. And then there was all the store owners. I knew them. Mr. Millar had a little store, a little, and he was different than most of your store owners, but uh, he was one of the originals or older Italians that was here. And he put up this little store and he'd keep lunch meat. And he had a little bit of everything in there. Uh, I didn't go in there that often, but a lot of kids would go in there and. He'd say, give the kids a piece of candy. So he'd go get some candy out of the, his safe and put give it out to the kids. And uh, then there was an older fellow that lived upstairs in his store, and we knew him. Uh, the Montegani's used to walk by our house, and Mr. Montegani would walk with his hands in, behind his back. He always clasped his hands and put them behind his back when he walked. So I remember him. We knew just about everybody in here, you know. Uh, we had friends, mother and daddy had friends that we used to visit, uh, the Buryolas and uh, the Verukis. And uh, I can't, and then of course we, she visited with her twin sister, Violet Artimani. And then we, she had a sister that lived up the hill here that her name was Fern Fury, and uh, she used to go visit with her. We had another aunt, Aunt Bessie, and like I said, we knew everybody, really. Um, when you were a young, young kid in Tawny Town. Tell me about where you lived and where your family members lived. What houses did you live in? What okay, lived? whenever uh, we first moved over here, uh, we lived on Clint's Road, and we had to drive back down a lane to get to our house. It was an old wood frame home. And I've got some pictures of that somewhere, but I don't know exactly. But it, uh, that's where we lived at first, and uh, it was two rooms. It was living in bedroom and kitchen. That was it. We had two rooms in the house, and uh, I can remember Mom cooking on a wood stove, wood yeah, wood kitchen stove, and uh, she washed her clothes by hand, you know, and those were the things that, they were just normal for us, not, you know, back then. And I was just a little kid. I was about uh, five or six, I think, when I lived there, maybe a little more. And then when I went away, and then mother and daddy moved west of Tawny Town, about four miles. Daddy wanted a place of his own, and so he bought a, a farm west of Tawny Town and he had chicken houses on it. And uh, then daddy planted grapes. And then later he planted peaches. So we always, we always had a peach orchard and we had a grape uh, vineyard. And he heard about this place and Shelley Camp that lived in Springdale, owned Camp's store, is who owned it. So daddy 
uh, ran into him or got together with him one day, and he was, he told him he was interested in the place. So he took Daddy up there to show him the place, and the chickens in the houses were so hungry, you could hear them peeping out at the road. And he said, listen to those chickens, they're hungry. Well, he had a renter in there, and the renter wasn't taking care of them. So he said, I'll take care of this. So uh, he and Daddy negotiated, and he got rid of the renter, and Daddy slept on the floor up there the first night. And he took over the chickens, and he made good money on them that year, I mean that bunch. And so he went and paid Mr. Camp a payment on the farm, and Mr. Camp said, that was such a good payment. He said, why don't you you stay here and raise chickens for me? And Daddy said, well, you might get it back, but you won't get it back that way. <laughs> I'll lose it, you know, but I, I'll pay for it. And he did. In just a short time, he, he raised chickens and, and paid for it. He moved a couple of chicken houses up there from over here at the old home place. And uh, so that added to our uh, capacity. And uh, then in later years, he planted grapes and he always had a few cows. And then I don't remember what year it was, but we he planted a peach orchard, planted one acre. And it did so well that he ended up planting the second eight acre. So we had a peach orchard till we got out of there. Um. What about your grandparents' homes? And did, did they live nearby? Um, my grandparents lived in that big old rock house uh, that's just went a mile west of Tiny Town. And uh, Grandpa Haney lived uh, just up the road about a quarter of a mile or less than a quarter. It was a half a quarter, really. And Grandpa and, and his, see, he lost his wife at a very young age. And he remarried, and so he lived at Elm Springs first, or just past Elm Springs. And uh, he he remarried, and he lived down there. And then he sold that and moved up here a mile and an eighth off of the road. So he lived up here close. Um, when you were a young kid in Tawnytown, what would you and your friends do for fun? Go up there and roller skate around the church sidewalk down to school and back up to church all afternoon on Sunday. That was one thing I did. I wore out a pair of metal skates doing that. It's the the top, the wheels on the metal skates split in two from me skating so much. But that was the main thing. Or we had little friends. Antoinette Penalto was one of my friends, and we used to get together once in a while. I'd go to her house, or she'd come to my house, and that's about it. I mean, there wasn't much to go do, but we skated, and I don't remember doing it. In the summertime, we'd go fishing. I mean, not fishing, but swimming once in a while when somebody would take us, because we couldn't drive. We just had to depend on an adult to take us. and uh, But that was about it. What would your parents and other adults that were their friends and neighbors, what would y'all, they do for fun? They'd get together and play cards, uh, and that sort of thing, you know. That was mainly what they did. They'd play uh, pitch and pinochle was the ones I remember. Um, what are your earliest memories of the Tawny Town Grape Festival? What was it like when you first started going? Tell me about that. Well, it was, I didn't like the rides myself. And so I didn't get excited about the Grape Festival and the rides. I wouldn't ride the Ferris wheel and uh, I'd get on the merry-go-round. But that I just wasn't very hip on the rides. And so when I got big enough, well, by the time I got married, well, then they put me on the bread to make the rolls. And I worked with these three ladies that were all sisters. 
they taught me how to make the bread. And when they made the bread back then, they did it in a dishpan with their hands like this. And then, uh, of course, later years, they got the, the hall and they got big machines and made it much easier. But anyhow, those girls taught me how to make the bread and then I never got off of it. Every year I was on the bread list. So I made bread every year for the Great Festival. And uh, I mean, there was times after I got older, my arms had hurt so bad I couldn't hardly go to sleep then that night. So my boys kept growing at this time. And so I thought, okay. So I got my boys to come up there and learn how to handle the bread and get the get the bread out of the ovens and put them on the table and they'd help me a lot. And I got a little rest after that. Uh, what what else can you remember about that girl? What about your... Uh husband and your kids. Tell me about them and what would they do at the Great Festival? Well, they had their own jobs. They had the wheel and they had bingo. And the kids would go in there and help in the dining room, like uh, clean off the tables and that sort of thing, help people. And uh, But everybody had their own jobs. I mean, they had a list and we each had a job to do of our own. So I was in the dining room, or in the kitchen, but they had their jobs to do too. And Pete run the wheel a few years, the big wheel, my husband. So it was just a lot of work and everybody had to pitch in. Uh, what were some of the other holidays that you remember, were there any local traditions on any of the holidays, like Halloween or Easter? The older kids used to get together and pull pranks on Halloween. Uh, we had a, the day after Halloween is a, a holy day of obligation, which means we had to go to Mass. It was, it was compulsory to go to Mass that day. Well, everybody get up and go to church so we can see what pranks the kids pulled up the night before. <laughs> they put wagons up on top of the store and they put toilet outhouses out in the street and they were they were honoring men <laughs> or young kids, I guess I should say. And then one year they got to turning over mailboxes, so they did that for a year or two and Oh, I can't remember all of it, but yeah, they that was the fun part of Halloween. But and at Christmas time, we had Christmas programs in the school, and the sisters would teach us different things. We had plays and singing, and and then once in a great while, uh, especially in the winter time or in the rainy days, the nuns would put on a record or had a record player, and we. The, the older ones would teach us younger ones how to dance. So we learned to dance in school too. And uh, I had a cousin, she was a good dancer and she taught me to jitterbug, so. And I love to dance. Uh, what about the dances that they used to have in town here? Did you ever, uh, where were they and did you ever go to them? Oh, uh, we went to them, but now the older people is the ones that really partake and, and dance more than we did. But we had bands that uh, the guys lived in Springdale. Well, you mentioned Danny Watson a while ago. He played in one of the bands. And uh, they would come to the basement of the school and they had a stage set up and they'd play all evening. And, uh, but that's, I can't remember exactly what their names were, but we, Doyle Clark and his brothers a lot. And then there was some Pinaltos. They'd get together once in a while. They all knew how to play something. And so they'd get together once in a while and we'd have a, just a local dance. But that's about it uh, that I can remember. Uh, what about the Tiny Town Grapers? Do you remember going to any of those games or where were they playing? Oh yeah, he, my husband played in uh, with them. And yeah, that was our Sunday thing to go. We had to sit and watch a ball game usually. <laughs> and 
us, the women would sit on the sidelines and we'd just scream and yell and, and make fun of some of those players, the, the opposing side, but we had a good time. <laughs> but uh, yes, we followed them just about every weekend during the season. Uh, what about the uh, people of the older men, probably mainly, that played bocce? What do you remember about that? Well, my dad was one of them. They'd go up there and and uh, and play bocce. Yeah, they'd get together. There was, I don't know, six or eight of them, or two. you know, they'd go up there and and sit around and and they'd take turns getting in and playing. And uh, yeah, my dad and Gildo Montagani and Lino Bariola, not Lino, Guy Bariola, Virgil Verrucchi. Uh, Buster Granada. I can't remember all of them, but there was, yeah. And at one time, now they have a new bocce court up at the park. Uh, I don't remember my dad ever playing in that one, but when they first start, played, it was up there across from the Venetian Inn. There was a store there, and it, at that time, I think it was a liquor store, but anyway, they had a bocce court right in back of it. And the liquor store, and there was a driveway between it, and there was another building there, and it was called the Luncheonette, which was, they could buy beer and then they could eat there too. They would serve, I don't know, sandwiches or whatever. But I had an aunt that used to run that. and. Uh, but the bocce players played it behind that store, and uh, they were there. And sometimes in the evening, they had lights, and they would go up there of an evening, especially in the summertime when it was hot. Well, they'd go up there in the evening and play bocce till they got tired. But yes, they the old men, Pete Tesaro, that's another one that played religiously, hated to lose his quarter. Um, anything else you can think of about Bochi? No, we all learned to play it eventually, but the men didn't let us have the court till they were through with it. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, like I said, it, it was up... It, we had to grow up a little bit before we could play with their balls. And then as my kids start coming up, my siblings or my children, they wanted to learn to play bocce. And so uh, I bought a bocce set of balls on my own. Lisa went to Tulsa shopping one day to, uh, hell, I can't remember the name of that store. But anyhow, uh, she went up there shopping, and I said, well, if they have a set of bocce balls, buy them for me. And so she come home with a set of bocce balls, and she got them for the price of a badminton set because they had marked them wrong. <laughs> so I got a, a good set of bocce balls for $7 or something, and I still got them. What other stories maybe do you have about Tawny Town that I didn't even think to ask you about? I don't remember it offhand. Okay, well, if if somebody who didn't know anything about Tawny Town or anything about this community said, tell me about your hometown of Tawny Town, what would you tell them? Well, it's a very friendly town, and it's it was more country than it is now because people are moving in, but uh, we never, I don't remember any violence and stuff like that going on here. And uh, it just, I think it's just a friendly farm town. It was a farm town whenever we were growing up. But it's not so much anymore. It's more businesses set up now. If um, 
if I ask you to finish this sentence, how would you say it? My favorite thing about Tawny Town is country. It's in the country more than it. The, it's not a big city yet. <laughs> uh, it's it's growing all the time, but uh, it's still a small community as far as I'm concerned. And uh, whenever Pete and I moved in this house, or he lived here always, we were the only house on this end of the road. We didn't have any neighbors. And now we've got neighbors all around us, which is fine. You know, we don't have a problem with that, but it's, uh, it's just grown from a little community town to a little bit bigger town now. So, because back whenever we were growing up, I think our population was 200, 200 and something. <laughs>